My name is Ben and uh, I am an uh, interactive artist. I'm based in Leeds. Um, I work with a company called Invisible Flock uh, with my colleagues Richard Warburton and Victoria Pratt and we're based at Patrick Studios, which some of you may know. Uh, I took part back in 2012 in um, the Leeds Creative Labs and the project that I ended up doing uh, wasn't called this, but this was the best I could come up with this morning, which was Drones, Ethics and Computer Games, which pretty much sums up exactly what we did. I um, worked with this handsome fellow, Kevin McNish, who is an academic at the University of Leeds. He is an applied ethicist, which is uh, something I never encountered until I did um, my creative lab, which means that he studies the practical applications of ethics in the real world. So ethics themselves are slightly, uh, well, our individual ethics are probably quite set, but ethics as a discipline is a very non-committal form of sort of thought, is what I discovered as we worked together. But he works specifically at looking at how uh, students can start to bring ethics into uh, their practice, whatever that may be, engineering or art or whatever. But Kevin has a particular interest in, it's quite weird of him, it looks like he's looking at me, um, Kevin, has quite a, um, Kevin has a specific interest in uh, security and surveillance uh, and also in uh, the use of drones. I think he had a vague kind of military background, I, I forget. Uh, and uh, as a digital artist who plays but also makes games, I have an interest in computer games. And for a long time I've been very interested in the relationship between computer games, especially big computer game franchises like Call of Duty, for example, and the relationship that they have to uh, the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq in both uh, representing um, the involvement of Western countries over there, but also in a certain degree in normalising uh, this notion of the war that happens over there. Uh, so in many ways, we were a match made in heaven. We worked together for about four sessions, uh, looking at how we could use um, our joint preoccupations on the subject matter and what that would kind of create at the end of it. Um, so what I'm specifically interested in was how uh, computer games rely a lot on perspective and cinematic tricks, but a lot on the perspective that they give you as the player in uh, the scenarios that you're playing out. So um, with Call of Duty, for example, you merrily skip on from the role of an SAS agent on a ship somewhere to that of being a Marine on the ground in Iraq through to being some other special forces combat unit in some other part of the world. And you kind of go on this globe trotting all boys adventure through uh, probably completely illegal conflicts. And th these are incredibly Map, you know, these things are played by thousands and thousands of people. And I'm not being alarmist, but it's what I find very interesting is how their perspectives and the point of views and the narratives they tell begin by being influenced by the real world, but how there's a feedback loop that begins to create itself, which is that the real world or our perceptions of it then starts to become influenced by these forms of mass entertainment. Some of you may remember these adverts, which were the British Army adverts. Uh, called, I think they were called Start to Think Soldier, something like that, uh, which came out. say breast P plus C, right? So that was kind of the option and there's a whole series of these and they actually link on so you can actually go to YouTube uh, and I think you can still uh, follow them through like a choose your own adventure. Um, and, and so, and there was a couple of these, there's a much longer one but bizarrely you can't find it on YouTube anymore which was, uh, if you've ever played or seen a first person shooter game you'll instantly have recognised those perspectives, the gun mounted sight and it goes through the whole, the whole thing and also adds the interactive element and so that stuff is, those point of view perspectives are, are directly drawing from first person shooters. They're drawing from, you know, uh, the fact that we are just used to these perspectives now. So no longer are we relying on exterior cinematic perspectives, but we're actually now using first person point of view to normalise uh, this conflict or our potential involvement in it. Um, so this was, this was one of our big starting points. We spent a lot of time talking about this. 
Um, and so Kevin uh, comes from a, a much more pragmatic point of view, uh, whereas I tended to have stronger feelings. And we decided that one of the really interesting areas to look at specifically was drone warfare, which rightly so is incredibly controversial. But one of the criticisms that's often levelled at it is that it's the computerized gaming of, of uh, warfare, which I think is uh, doing both games and warfare and oversimplified injustice, because I think it's much more complicated than that. Um, but we, we, we started looking at whether there, we could use video games as a format and as a potential teaching tool. As a potential teaching tool, or at least as a way for him to explore the subject matter that he teaches his students. Um, and so we started looking around at ways in which we could do this. So within the context of the lab, I think we had maybe four sessions together. Um, and so we started first looking at the, uh, the terrain and the field that we were working in, so to speak, uh, and seeing what was already out there and saw that uh, there is already uh, a lot of representation of uh, the kind of drone perspective or the distant uh, perspective in game. So again, this is modern warfare. I'm not picking on it, it just happens to have all the stuff that I wanna show. Um, and in the case of modern warfare, even almost the memification of drone combat as this perspective. So where this is a, a mission that's very, very popular in the game, And it carries on. But so this is a game, by the way. This is a real life footage, just in case the two things got blurred. Um, so we just started looking at, at kind of how, what it means to be offered these perspectives, and these incredibly sort of intimate, hands on perspectives of things that are much more complicated and much more horrific uh, than they were being uh, potentially presented to us. So we settled on uh, a game called Armour 2. I'm going to go ahead and assume that none of you know what Armour 2 is, which is fine. Armour 2 is a uh, um, it's a really strange thing. It's made by a bunch of Polish game developers. Uh, and they create this sprawling, uber-realistic military sim that is entirely voiced by Polish men putting on American accents. And it's best illustrated by how weird it is that if you're playing the main central mission, your character, some horrible stuff happens to your main character's unit and he has the choice to go back into battle or to not. And if you choose to not go back into battle, the screen goes dark and a voiceover happened, which is you back in the States in the bar with your buddies and you're talking to someone and they're telling, you're talking about how bad it is and it all kind of fades out and it actually then goes, that was all a dream, of course you would never leave. And then you're back on the battlefield. It's just the most, it's just the weirdest game in the world and it almost hates you for playing it, but at the same time, it's sort of brilliant in, its, in its how obtuse it is. Um, and it's perhaps most famous because what the developers did is they make it right for something called modding. So if you don't know what modding is, it basically is when game developers leave aspects of their games open for people to go in and tinker with. That can be uh, all the way from just changing a voice file so a character sounds different to complete kind of game conversions. It's most famous for a mod called DayZ, uh, which is a zombie apocalypse and where these gentlemen have chosen to wear nothing but clown masks and underpants as an example of how potentially creative you can be with how you want to participate in it. But it was perfect for what we wanted to do. We wanted to be able to move fast, to mess around with some concepts, and not have to worry about all the heavy lifting of creating our own game engine. So we uh, picked up Armour 2 and uh, started to use the mission editor, which comes with it, to uh, explore perspective. So to explore uh, the notion of uh, contemporary conflict uh, from the ground and from the air simultaneously. Um, so these are just screenshots of the, the editors that we were using. So you see objects, that's, our, that's the little drone there, and that's kind of the path flights that we were programming in. And trying to kind of see if we could recreate some uh, famous sort of cases that are used when best exemplifying some of the ethical issues um, around, around um, the use of drones. One of the most famous being, for example, a drone operator who saw a uh, shadow from the air in the way that they see them doing something by the roadside 
and was uh, passing it back up the chain of command to whether they had the order to open fire. And it wasn't until someone else walked into the shot and they went, this other person who's walked in the shot is incredibly tall. Why are they so freakishly tall? That they realised they were looking at a child playing in the dirt. And without the perspective of distance that the camera was giving them, there was no way for them to interpret that. That's a famous teaching case that they use quite often. And so we messed around with looking at whether we could recreate that, both from the perspective of the air, but also from the ground. So in the top screen, um, you've got the uh, stuff that we set up at ground level, where we wanted you to play as uh, someone living in an Afghan village. And in the bottom, you've got the perspective of the same village and the same player, but seen uh, from the top down. And um, it was a really fascinating experiment. And I think for Kevin, I'll speak for him, he's not here, but he, um, for him, it was really interesting to be able to explore stuff that is, I think, um, often um, quite hard, he says, for his students to necessarily fully comprehend, or rather, it's very easy for them to see what the right answer is, because often the correct answer is very obviously weighted. Whereas he was like, here, there's something very interesting in uh, the potential for, for visualising it, but also for people to participate simultaneously. So to have one student playing as the operator and one student playing as the person on the ground, and to have these scenarios play out in real time in that way. Um, I've got a very brief little snippet of video, which I hope will work and should just give you a little sense of what we did together. Right, here we go. Um, particularly my area of research is in applied ethics. Well, the project I've been working on with Ben Eaton has been looking at drone warfare and how to consider some of the ethics of drone warfare. The has come out with about drones and drone operations is that the operators sitting back in Nevada sit by computer screens with monitors that have shown them what the drone can see, and which have been effectively criticised as being like computing. And so it's kind of a nice irony then that we were able to take a computer game mod and use that. So that's just some very quick screenshots. The only things I've got left, sadly, of the work that we did together. Um, but uh, so that was some of the stuff that we, that we put together. So it was really just a real scratching at the beginnings of an idea, uh, which uh, sadly, but for no particular reason, we didn't take on into anything further, but it would have been lovely. But um, yeah, that's what we did with our time. And it was, uh, it was really interesting for both of us um, to both look at those really specific contexts. For me, it allowed me to scratch a very particular itch that I'd had for a long time about computer games and um, and their use, and then for Kevin, I think it allowed him to experiment with a, uh, a whole set of tools that he never considered using before. So there we are. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.